Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on how and why countries are setting 20 miles an hour and 30 kph limits as national urban defaults. My name is Deborah Sims and I'm the Vice President of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation and I have the great pleasure of being your chair for this afternoon's session. Our topic today is such an important one. I'm a road safety engineer, a road user and a parent, so it's one that's really close to my heart. And judging by the number of delegates today, it's important to all of you too. Every year, more than 1.3 million people die around the world in road crashes. That's an average of one life lost every 24 seconds. And speed is a factor in around a third of those deaths. Today's discussion is particularly timely because as we will hear, there are currently numerous parallel initiatives underway around the world to progress lower speed limits. And it's creating real momentum around this issue. Furthermore, as you will probably be aware, this is the sixth UN Global Road Safety Week, and it's focusing on securing policy commitments at national and local level to deliver 20 mile per hour, 30 kph speed limits in urban areas, generating local support for low speed measures and inviting people to sign an open letter to support a focus on livable streets. We have a really exciting and packed programme for you today with six expert speakers who are going to provide a range of perspectives on this issue. First up, we're going to be hearing from Alvaro Gomez Mendez, head of the National Road Safety Observatory, DGT, which I believe is Dirección General de Tráfico. Alvaro, you can tell me if I'm wrong on that, from Spain. And he'll be talking about how Spain became the first country to set a national urban 30 kph limit as its default in, in May 2021. We're then going to move to Wales and hear from Lee Waters. Lee is the Deputy Minister for Climate Change in the Welsh Parliament, who will tell us how Wales is planning a similar national 20 miles per hour limit default for 2023. We're very privileged to have with us Nan Tran, Head of Safety and Mobility from the World Health Organization. Nan will be giving us the global view on 30 kph urban limits. Then we're going to change to a slightly different viewpoint from Scarlett McNally. Scarlett is consultant orthopaedic surgeon at Eastbourne District General Hospital, and she'll be talking about the medical and public health case for lower speeds. After Scarlett, we will hear from Richard Thorold, trustee of the Louis Thorold Foundation. Richard will be giving us a campaigner's view on a 20 mile an hour national urban limit and how this impact issue has impacted on him and his family. Finally, we'll hear from Rod King, MBE. Rod is the founder and campaign director of 20s Plenty for Us. He will wrap up the presentation, summarising the benefits of the 20s Plenty approach and the actions that are being taken to encourage and support lower traffic speed limits in our urban areas. We want this to be a really lively and interactive session. So please put your questions and comments in the Q&A uh, section as we go through the presentations. The plan is that we'll hear presentations from each of our experts and then I'll invite all of our speakers to switch their cameras back on and join a panel discussion where I'll be putting your questions to them. If you have a question for a particular speaker, please just put their name at the start of your question. So without any further ado, I would like to start by introducing our first speaker, Alvaro Gomez Mendez. Alvaro is the head of the National Road Safety Observatory, DGT Spain, and he'll be telling us how Spain became the first country to set a national urban 30 kph uh, limit default in May 2021. Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I would like to thank uh, 20s Plenty for organizing this event, for their endless advocacy and campaigning, and their helping spread the 30 km per hour speed limit uh, all over the world. Um, I would like to give a, a warm welcome to all the speakers and audience, and I hope you are all well and safe. I'm going to talk about the Spanish regulation on the 30 km per hour speed limit. Uh, last November, when our government approved this regulation, we would never have thought that it would come into force just one week before uh, a road safety week uh, devoted to uh, 30 streets, which uh, we are very pleased and this uh, sort of coincidence has helped us uh, uh, spread our, our message in, in even a more powerful, powerful uh, way. So I would also like to thank international organizations and NGOs 
who have uh, supported us uh, throughout this uh, uh, this path and this uh, th this process of getting our national regulation approved. So moving on to the next slide, uh, I will uh, briefly talk you through what we what have we have we done, why have we done it, how have we done it, and how have we explained the measure uh, in Spain. So just a uh, in the next slide, uh, I will give you some uh, basic information about uh, the measure. Um, before uh, uh, May 2021, the, de the default sp speed limit inside built-up areas was 50 kilometers per hour. And since May 11th, uh, that means only uh, last week uh, that the measure came into force, the default speed limits are 30 kilometers per hour on streets with a single lane for a given direction, 20 kilometers per hour on streets with no pavement, what uh, the so-called uh, shared the streets, and 50 kilometers per hour elsewhere. So uh, I will just provide you with uh, some uh, pictures to, to illustrate this, but um, uh, no, please uh, just going back to the next, to the previous slide, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, dedicated lanes such as bus lanes and bicycle lanes are not considered. So we, the, the, the practical rule for anyone driving in Spain is whenever there is only one lane in your direction, the default speed limit will be 30 kilometers per hour. And we developed um, uh, uh, guidelines for implementation uh, for local authorities, which are available on our website. They are only in Spain so far, but we are we are uh, we are working on on the translation into English, and I hope it will be available uh, very soon. So, moving on to the next slide, uh, these are some pictures uh, taken from these guidelines. And so, just uh, very quickly, uh, on the top you see some shared streets. They have no pavement, even even if there are bollards on the side. So the speed limit there is uh, the default speed limit is 20. Uh, regardless uh, of of them having one uh, or uh, or two lanes, um, the, on the top uh, right you have a, a single lane which is adjacent to a bicycle uh, lane, so the speed limit there is 30. Uh, uh, at the at the medium line left uh, there is a one lane street, so the speed limit is 30. Then we have a one plus one street at right at the center. The speed limit in both lanes uh, is 30. Uh, medium right, uh, there is a two plus one street. So the speed limit on the direction with a, just one lane is also 30. And at the bottom, you see uh, uh, a single lanes uh, adjacent to dedicated lanes such as bus uh, lanes or taxi lanes. So the speed limit in both lanes uh, becomes uh, 30 kilometers per hour. So moving on, please. Um, so why have we done this? Because uh, first of all, the trends in fatalities inside cities were very worrying. Uh, in 2019, the, the, the number of fatalities increased by 6% inside built up areas. Uh, whereas the the, the uh, outside built-up areas, there was a reduction of 6%. And if we look at the evolution over the last uh, nine or 10 years, in 2011, the number of fatalities was uh, 457, uh, while in 2019, it was uh, more than 500. Furthermore, more than 80% of uh, fatalities in cities are vulnerable road users. And um, uh, if we look at pedestrians, 70% uh, of uh, killed pedestrians are aged uh, 65 or more. So there, there is, there is a, a population in Europe is aging, so the older pedestrians are, are a priority for, for us. And this, this is also a result of uh, urban trends, such as the concentration of population in cities. Uh, new means of mobility, the, the, the rising of e-commerce and the growing trends in walking, cycle, cycling and the use of e-scooters. Most of these trends have been reinforced by the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. There, the, the, there is also uh, scientific evidence uh, about the positive impact of implementing a speed limit of, of 30. We know the, the relationship between the fatality risk for a pedestrian uh, 
and uh, the 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 speed of the car. We know that uh, that uh, the the uh, the impact on stopping distance and thus uh, in the probability of of crash. And we had uh, evidence of existing cases both in in Spain and and abroad. So I think that uh, th there's no there's no discussion that uh, having a, a lower speed limit would be uh, uh, would have a positive impact on the number of of crashes and the severity of of crashes. So uh, moving on, please. Um, and there is this measure is also uh, aligned with uh, every. Uh, international commitments and recommendations. It's aligned with the 2030 agenda. I think that uh, a number of SDGs are related to the speed limit of, of 30, such as uh, uh, 3, 7, 11, uh, or 13. It is aligned with the, the Stockholm Declaration of 2020, which uh, mandated a maximum road travel speed of 30 kilometers per hour in areas where vulnerable road users and vehicles mix in a frequent in planned manner, except where strong evidence exists that higher speeds are safe. And it's also aligned with the UN resolution of uh, 2021, which, uh, of 2020, I'm sorry, which, which called to adopt, implement, and enforce policies and measures to actively protect and promote pedestrian safety and cycling mobility. So this was the international framework. Now, uh, moving on to how uh, we implement the measure. Uh, the, the, the truth is that we've been talking about setting a national default speed limit of 30 for a number of years. So the idea was not new. And, and in the meantime, many Spanish cities uh, became what uh, so-called 30 cities. Uh, you see a number of them in the, in, the, in the graph. This was a graph that we made Two years ago, it was a part of the policy analysis report that was attached to the draft of the regulation. And since since then, uh, many cities have have uh, joined. And some some of these cities are known worldwide. Are, I mean, the, probably some of the best known are uh, Pontevedra and Bilbao, which are the two uh, last winners of the European Road Safety Award. So many. Spanish cities were moving to a speed limit of uh, 30. Now, moving on, please. Uh, so uh, our approach to this is that this could only be done with the support of and demand from local authorities. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, over the last years, uh, more and more cities were implementing measures related to the uh, 30 kilometer speed limit. And this created a growing support from other municipalities and, and the civil society. So at the end, we have more than 8,000 municipalities in Spain. We, can talk, uh, we cannot talk to them one by one, but there was a full endorsement from the National Federation of Municipalities, which gathers them all together. And now, just uh, coming to the end of the presentation and moving on to the next slide, please. So how have we explained it? Uh, we, we, we have said that this is a measure fully in line with the safe system approach, with, which uh, looks for an error-proof system. So it, if a driver gets distracted or a pedestrian crosses without looking, there should be no uh, fatal or serious crash. And this could only be achieved with a speed limit of 30. We have said that this should be part of an integral approach where mobility planning, street design, and speed limit go hand in hand. And this is related to the 2080 model with uh, where we said that 80% of the streets should carry, 20% uh, of the streets should carry the 80% of the traffic uh, at higher speeds and 80% of the streets should have uh, low speeds uh, and carry 20% of the traffic. So we have asked uh, municipalities to go beyond just uh, lowering the speed limit and to work in, a, in an integral uh, approach where where uh, mobility planning and street design is are aligned with the new speed limit and we believe that the full benefits will come in the medium and long term and and will go beyond road safety and they will include less congestion less pollution less noise and and improved public health we believe that this is a cross-cutting subject and that building alliances is also crucial for the success of the measure uh, i believe that Road safety agencies should not 
do this fighting alone and the uh, alliances with other uh, with agencies from other sectors, uh, civil society and public and local authorities are all essential. So this, I'm just finishing. I've come to the end of my presentation, so I'm looking forward to, to questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Very interesting. And your, your comment there about how anyone making a mistake, it shouldn't be a death penalty. It, there shouldn't be such serious consequences uh, really resonated with me. Thank you. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're going to hear all of our presenters and then we'll take questions at the end. Uh, thank you to those of you who are sending questions in. Please, please continue to do so. Next, we're going to hear from Lee, Lee Waters, Deputy Minister for Climate Change, Welsh Parliament. Um, and Lee is going to tell us how Wales are planning to do something quite similar, I believe. Over to you, Lee. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm uh, joining you from Cardiff in Wales, and uh, as you mentioned, I am the uh, Deputy Minister responsible for Transport. Uh, we've just had a change of government, uh, 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 been re-elected, and we've been, Transport been put into a new climate change department, putting climate, uh, transport alongside planning, environment, energy, uh, regeneration, planning, uh, I'm missing some others, but a large super ministry to try and put the, all the tools necessary to achieve uh, climate change mitigation all in one place. And this uh, reform we're bringing into this speed in residential streets is a really important part uh, of our climate change mission overall, but also a really important part of showing people the benefits of behaviour change, not just in climate change, but in the whole multi Simplicity of ways, and I think uh, winning hearts and minds is going to be a crucial part uh, of doing this. And for all the surveys which show us that this is a popular measure, that reducing speeds in uh, urban areas uh, is welcomed, uh, we know that uh, this has been dragged into the culture wars that we've seen sweeping across Europe and the United States. Things presented as being anti-car are politically toxic. Uh, I've just spent a month knocking doors uh, of my electorate, and I can tell you not once did one person uh, welcome the introduction of this, but a good handful uh, were very angry with me for introducing this. So it is important as a frontline politician that we get this right, we bring this in a way uh, that will go with the grain of public opinion and will be accepted and uh, welcomed and not resisted. So we're taking our time and taking a careful uh, approach. Uh, we currently have a situation where just 1% of the road network has 20 mile an hour as uh, the speed limit. Uh, and given that uh, the default is 30 miles per hour, so not kilometers to be clear, miles per hour, uh, we know that 50% of all road casualties are on uh, roads with 30 mile an hour. So this is clearly an area from a casualty reduction point of view, which uh, is the key to focus uh, on. Our current approach allows communities to apply for their roads to become 20 miles per hour, but it is a slow uh, and expensive and complicated process. So what we decided to do is to turn the process on its head. So rather than having to make the case to turn your street from 30 to 20, we've decided to make the default speed limit 20 miles an hour, but to allow a case to be made to turn it 30. But the onus being on those who wish to see it at 30 to make the case for that and not uh, the other way around. Uh, and I must pay tribute at this point to Rod King and the 20th Plenty campaign for the tremendous work uh, they've done in building a consensus in creating pressure for this to become about in Wales. We would not be doing this uh, policy change were it not for Rod King and for the 20th Plenty uh, campaign. Uh, the civil society led movement is essential for creating the space to allow policymakers and decision makers to bring in the change that are necessary in our car dominated culture. So I just want to pay uh, a very sincere tribute to Rod and his colleagues for the work they've been doing over many years to allow us to get to this point. So briefly, the process we followed, uh, I set up in uh, May 20, 2019, a task force led by uh, Phil Jones, who is a, an urban planner and highways engineer, uh, with a whole range of stakeholders. So all the people you would need to make this work and all the people who might cause us problems uh, on one uh, task force to work through the detail 
to ensure that what we came up with was practical and workable and would not cause those at the sharp end of implementation problems because we want this to be effective. So that reported a year later, last July, July 2020, and we intend bringing this in across Wales in two years time, in April uh, 2023. Uh, the task force report, which is available online, if you search for uh, Welsh Government 20 mile an hour task force, you'll see the full report, had 21 recommendations, which we have uh, accepted in full. The process now is we are trialling this in eight different communities right across Wales, so a real deliberate mix of settings, rural uh, and urban, and we're testing a whole different set uh, of approaches. Uh, we'll be looking at the community engagement uh, side of it, we'll be looking at enforcement, working closely with the police, and I, will, I would say to begin with the police were quite unhelpful, but have become uh, fully engaged uh, and want to work with us to make this effective. I will also be trialling uh, monitoring. So we want to make sure we tease out any teething problems in the pilot stage uh, over the next, starting this summer and over the next uh, year or so. And we have developed a GIS tool to give local authorities, because uh, as in the case in Spain, the local authorities will be the key to delivering this, uh, to give them a map of every area which shows what our formula suggests should be the 20 mile an hour sections, which should be the 30 mile an hour sections. So there will be exceptions, but these are best driven at a local level. But there are a set of criteria where you cannot have an exception. So, for example, you're not allowed to have 30 mile an hour uh, within 100 meters of an educational setting, of a school or a college. You can't have it close to a community center or, or to a hospital. So there are safeguards in place, but we want to give some degree of flexibility to local authorities to make the judgments best on their knowledge of their own local settings. But the intention is each will be given a set of maps for their areas with what we recommend and they will then consult with their communities if those are in the right place because again it's really important that we bring people uh, with us so we make sure this becomes uh, embedded and common sense. Um, so once that process is underway, the pilot process is underway, we'll be looking to roll that out. We have to pass some, some legislation, some statutory instruments. Uh, we then will be starting uh, that exceptions process, as I described, we'll be starting a behavioural change promotional campaign. I say now this is part of the Climate Change Ministry, this will be part of the broader uh, package of uh, behaviour change work we want to be doing uh, to encourage people to think about the impact of their and behaviours to meet the uh, societal challenge we all have to get to net zero by uh, 2050. We'll be starting an enforcement strategy, again working closely with local authorities and with the police, and then in April 2023 we'll be introducing the final piece of the legislation, the statutory instruments to bring that into full force. So there's a lot of work to do over the next two years to get the legislation, the regulations and the implementation uh, right, but we are uh, confident that this will be accepted, just as we've seen a change of attitudes on recycling, a change of attitudes on smoking, a uh, change of attitudes on uh, safety in cars and on drinking. We think that it's part of that behaviour change package which brings us a more civilised uh, and safe society. Uh, and again, it's uh, fantastic to be part of an international movement of change. And that is led from the bottom up. Were it not for civil society pushing this change, this would not be happening. But it's also essential that we take communities with us if we want this to work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. Clearly lots of work to do, but uh, yes, uh, heading in the right direction. Thank you. Um, We'll now move on to uh, our next speaker. Please carry on putting your questions in the in the chat. Uh, we're going to move on to talk to, uh, or hear from rather, Nan Tran. Nan is the Head of Safety and Mobility at the World Health Organization, and he's going to be giving us uh, in eight minutes the global view on 30 kilometer per hour urban limits. Over to you, Nan. Thanks very much, Jabra, and thanks for um, having me here as part of this conference. Uh, it's really exciting to hear the examples from Spain and also looking forward to actually uh, getting insights from Wales as you implement this uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, as a standard setting organization, we really benefit from the country experiences so that we can actually share them with others as well. 
I'm very going to quickly go through a couple of points in terms of explaining a bit about why we think uh, this is important uh, in terms of the science behind it, and also reflect a bit on some of what we consider some of the important implementation challenges that we see in implementing 20 mile per hour uh, speed limits. Next, please. Next one as well. Actually, you can skip to the next one. Um, we've already talked about the Stockholm Declaration. We know that that's part of why this is the rationale. We know the next slide about the week, and we don't have to talk about that. So you go to the next slide. Next slide. So here, uh, historically, in terms of WHO, we were very, we've always been concerned about speed as a major issue in terms of its impact on the likelihood of crash, but also its impact on the severity of injuries as well as the likelihood of fatalities. Historically, the focus has been on looking at the, uh, you know, the, the reaction times and the braking distances, because the idea was always thinking about how much time do, do we need to actually allow people to stop in case, for example, a child appears in the middle of the road. Um, but that actually, you know, was a starting point. Next slide. We've now moved on beyond that. And the question no longer is about how much time does it require for us to stop to prevent hitting a child or hitting a person to actually what is the, the at what speed can we safely hit somebody? And that seems like a strange question to ask, but it is essentially the question that we've been asking ourselves is at uh, what speed can we hit somebody and still uh, ensure that that person is unlikely to die? Now, there have been numbers, numerous studies that have looked at the impact of speed and at what distances, uh, at what speeds and the impact of speed on, on, on a collision with a pedestrian. Um, and, and there are varying different figures, but the, the graph is always the same. It basically shows that there is an exponential increase beyond 20 kilometers, uh, sorry, 20 miles per hour or 30 kilometers. This graph happens to come from uh, data that was compiled from the AAA um, uh, the, uh, foundation in the United States. And it basically shows that at 20 miles per hour, a child or somebody uh, around uh, 30 years old might actually have a 3% of death, so 97% chance of survival. There are actually newer studies that show uh, even greater chances of, uh, of survival. So the point is that 30 kilometers per hour or 20 miles an hour is actually considered a safe speed because one can be hit at a car traveling at this speed and still survive. Next slide, please. We also recognize, of course, that there are co-benefits of having safer or slower speeds. And as Alvaro has already said, the, you know, having slower speeds means uh, reduced emissions, which is good for the climate. It is also good for livable cities and sustainable cities and communities. And it also encourages, because of the slow speeds, more walking and cycling. And that, of course, is better for physical health. So there are numerous co-benefits of, of, of this approach. Next slide, please. Um, but from our perspective, the other really important point that we've uh, uh, taken into account is the issue of equity. Now, in North America and the United Kingdom and many parts of Europe, when one chooses to walk or cycle, it's really a personal choice. I do so because I'm concerned about the environment and I think it's better for my health. But in many parts of the world, pedestrians and cyclists do so not because of a personal choice. They do it because of necessity. And this is because they can't afford to have cars. And so when we consider uh, infrastructure and roads and streets that are designed primarily for cars that actually are allowing higher speeds, they are by default privileging and prioritizing the needs of those that are economically more advantaged. So actually a focus on slower speeds means actually rebalancing, if you will, uh, the, 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 the priorities for all road users, including those that are economically disadvantaged. So this is actually important from an equity perspective as well. Next slide. I'd like to just reflect a bit on the implementation challenge. I think one of the biggest hurdles of, 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 of implementing this approach is, of course, getting the buy-in, political buy-in, and the, 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 the ability to actually put in place policies. And I really, really commend uh, Spain, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how that works uh, and also um, to see how the experience of Wales will play out in the next couple of years as implementation uh, begins. Um, but we know that the implementation of a policy is actually the other half of the challenge. Next slide. So from our perspective, we see a couple of important uh, sort of challenges. One, of course, is actually 
uh, changing the perceptions of risk. And these illustrations that I'm about to show are quite old. I think they're actually about 20 years old. Next slide. And they basically illustrate, you know, the, the sort of the how we as, as people sort of perceive risk differently depending on what we see. And part of the challenge moving forward is really about changing the perceptions of risk. Next slide. Again, you know, it, it's really about thinking about, you know, how would we react when we look at this picture versus the next slide, please go to the next slide, and, and what we would consider a safe a safe speed, for example. So obviously that's one major challenge is thinking about how do we actually change public perceptions uh, of, of what is safe and what is dangerous and, and how uh, the amount of risk that they are willing to engage in, because that is a big part of getting people to comply with slower speeds. Next slide. The other uh, point that I wanted to raise is when we talk about speed, you know, the, the issue of enforcement immediately comes to the forefront and people always talk about the fact that in order to actually make speed, uh, slow speeds work, we actually have to have good enforcement. And I absolutely agree with the, 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 the notion that speed enforce, uh, enforcement is really central to making, a, is, is a central part of this. However, I actually would like to suggest that we don't think about enforcement as the first thing to do, but actually as the last thing to do. And I'll tell you why. Next slide. So I actually pulled this picture and I believe if I'm not mistaken that it comes from Ireland, but I could be wrong. But this actually gives you is actually uh, an example of, of, uh, of a road that is currently set um, that does have a 30 kilometer speed, uh, 30 kilometer speed limit or 20 miles an hour speed limit. And, and one looks at it and, and, and one questions whether or not, you know, 30 kilometers, you know, the, the, the conditions presented in this photo actually, you know, facilitate or encourage a 30 kilometer speed limit. If you go to the next slide, here's another image of a 30 kilometer speed limit that, that I pulled out. I'm not exactly sure where it comes from. I think it's somewhere in the Netherlands or Belgium. But the point that I want to raise here is if you compare and contrast the two images, it should be very clear that the environment, the way that the roads are built and the way that the, 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 the environments around the road conditions actually have a very big part of in, in, in terms of getting people to comply with the 30 kilometer speed limit or 20 mile per hour. So, you know, the first thing that we ought to be thinking about as we actually move forward with actually promoting 20 miles per hour is thinking about the conditions around uh, of the road and what can we do to ensure that those conditions are actually encouraging, promoting or conducive to a 30 kilometer uh, an hour uh, um, a speed limit so that it is more intuitive. In public health, our main model has always been make the right choice, the easy, uh, excuse me, make the easy choice, the right choice. And for road safety, I think we should try to do the same thing. So if we want people to drive slower, we should make sure that the conditions in which they're driving on are supportive of that slower speed. Next slide. Uh, uh, actually, you can skip this slide. Uh, and the one point that I wanted to make really was about thinking about how do we engage with different types of actors. So in this slide, this comes from NACTO, and it's just a really simple diagram of looking about how do we design safer roads and, and, and roads that are conducive to, 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 to more sustainable cities. And again, it's just hiding the, the, the point that other actors have a really important role to play, business owners, commerce, restaurants, they all have a stake in this. And if we think about how do we encourage a movement around slower speeds, it's also about engaging with these types of actors in support of this movement so that it's not just about road engineers and transport planners that are responsible for this. It's the entire community as well. Next slide. So I'm going to end there because I know that uh, we have lots of speakers, um, but I think that really, you know, from our perspective, one of the challenges that we have is that we don't actually have a lot of evidence uh, from countries. And so for this reason, we're, we are very, very excited uh, that Spain and Wales and I think also the Netherlands are starting to think about this approach because our goal is to be able to collect these experiences, collect evidence so that we can actually share this with other countries in the hopes that more countries will be able to adopt a similar approach. So I look forward to, to being part of this conversation as, 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 as countries roll this out. And as I said, we're really ex uh, excited that this is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nam. Very, uh, very interesting. And uh, as you say, the psychology and getting um, getting people to feel that they're doing the right thing and feeling comfortable in the space doing that is, is really important. Thank you very much.
Um, we're going to have a slight change of direction now. Um, we're going to uh, hear uh, a slightly different perspective, but a really important one as well. Um, we're going to hear from Scarlett McNally. Scarlett is the consultant orthopaedic surgeon at Eastbourne District General Hospital. And Scarlett's going to be talking to us about the medical and public health case for lower speeds. Over to you, Scarlett. Um, thank you very much. And it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Scarlett McNally, um, a consultant orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and on the next slide, I've got my conflicts of interest. Um, so basically, I, it's an NHS salary. All the organisations that I'm involved with are on a voluntary basis or have been involved with in the past, um, which is great fun, but it's, it's on similar lines. Next slide, please. Uh, so that's my day job, uh, operating clinics, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm also, and have been for 10 years, on the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Um, you can see me at the back there. Um, and on that basis, I've been able to represent my college um, in some uh, other work cross collegiately uh, with other organisations. Next slide, please. Um, and this is what I want to bring to your attention. This was the report that I was lead author for in 2015, Exercise the Miracle Cure. And in it, it says that exercise at a dose of 150 minutes a week reduces your risk of ever getting dementia by 30%, uh, breast cancer 25%, um, depression 30%. And in the middle column, does it treat those conditions Yes, it does. It treats every single one of them. It is a factor in management. And on the right hand column is the lifetime risk. These are incredibly common conditions. These are what um, many people have, um, particularly as, as they get older. Um, this is what we're living with uh, increasingly. Next slide, please. Um, and it's not just me saying this. This is the uh, chief medical officers from all four of the UK nations. Um, Adults should be doing 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. And that I've circled it in red. I've particularly put the infographic for disabled adults, just to remind people that this includes all adults and actually 21% of uh, UK population uh, does uh, have a disability. Um, and it includes older people as well. And for children, the amount is one hour a day. So this is moderate intensity exercise. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a paper slide I've borrowed from a BMJ paper. And again, it shows those reduction in risks. And the key thing I'd like to point out is that um, your normal risk, your average everyday risk is, is one, and then it drops down. If it drops down to 0.9, that's 90% of risk. 0.8, it's 80% of risk. And I've, it's, it's a dose dependent curve. So every little bit makes a little bit more difference. So the getting up off your sofa and doing something has the most magical effect on your future health. Um, and it's not just future in the future, it's future right now. Um, I've put the little triangle at that dose of 150 minutes a week of moderate cycling. Um, uh, and actually there are benefits up to about an hour of day of activity, but basically 21 minutes a day gets you, uh, reduces your risk by that much. We need to do it basically. N next slide, please. And this is how little we actually do. So this is not the percentages of people reaching that 150 minutes a week. This is the people that do nothing. This is the people that do less than 30 minutes per week. It's different across different ethnicities. It's different across different ages. So in the UK, it's about 25% of people do no exercise at all, class physically inactive. In the over 65, it's 37%. Next slide, please. And actually, as a surgeon, um, it has a huge impact on me because um, of the patients that have a complication after surgery are five times more likely if they're inactive or if they're frail. It's not just affecting the fitness, getting through an anaesthetic. It also exercise has an effect on inflammation, on your metabolism, kind of empowerment, feeling ready for something, feeling you can cope, uh, management of pain, uh, mental health improvement and management of all other conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, Macmillan produced a report with the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, that uh, exercise before, during and after treatment for cancer 
improves physical function, improves well-being, and reduces the risk of cancer recurrence. And there's a big project to try and get prehabilitation in. It's got amazing results. People coming up to an operation doing an exercise package. Next slide, please. So how to do it? Um, Moving Medicine has got a very good resource for um, medical healthcare professionals and for the public on motivational interviewing. It's about making a habit. It's got to be something you do, not something you think you do. Um, and then you increase, you just start. That's the difficult bit. Increase frequency, intensity, time and type. And you've got to have a goal with little rewards and that kind of thing and work out what's stopping you. Um, and then little things, you know, can you walk kids or grandchildren to school, go for a walk with granny rather than taking her out for a meal it's it's much cheaper and it's much nicer uh, next slide please um and and this is kind of kind of why do we do anything we're actually um we kid ourselves all the time with what, what we do really um we, we're just waiting for the dopamine hit the procrastination uh, thing we need to set those many rewards uh, the serotonin um is if you go out and do something together sign up for a charity ride or something then you have to do it because you're not letting the side down and you get that oxytocin from doing a good deed we're far better at doing stuff for other people than for ourselves and the endorphins you get take 20 minutes to work so i cycle to work and i cycle home it takes about 15 minutes i arrive serene but basically people need everything ready um running shoes by the front door um waterproof trousers in your bag so you're ready for anything next slide please but it's actually not just about us it's not about you know the posh people doing what they want because they can afford their bike or whatever with for individuals you've got to have that efficacy and the practical suggestions but actually we need to change society change what's normal change what professionals say change the culture change what your family are expecting you to do and to do that, we need to change institutions, regulations, funding, infrastructure and policy. And those pictures are kind of within my lifetime. I'm an awful lot older than I look. Plant click every trip. I used to pick people's glass out of people's faces in casualty departments because they thought they'd be they'd be fine. And, you know, they had good reaction times uh, to stop. So we can change this. We need to change it. And that changes culture. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, so the BMA produced a very good report called um, uh, Healthy Transport Equals Healthy Lives, and they said the best forms of exercise are those fit into everyday life. Next, please. Um, electric cycles are an absolute game changer for women, older people, those with disabilities, people with children or with cargo. Um, they flatten hills, they make distances better, and those two references are from some big studies that if you give people an electric bike they won't give it back again and they actually get their exercise because they go they travel for longer um and um it, it is they are fantastic um those are two of mine in my hallway next please and the health benefits of active travel outweigh the risks by 10 to 1. so you have risks of pollution risks of collisions but those benefits to your health mental and physical health um, outweigh by 10 to 1. You can add up all the references there uh, if you choose. Next slide, please. And actually, these are the statistics. Who are we living for? Who are we creating the environment for? 20% of the population are children, 18% are over age 65, 32% of adults in the UK um, have a, a, a working age adults, if, uh, well, let's say that any, any, any more, have a dependent child getting to school and back. 57% um, UK adults say cycling is too dangerous, 34% of children are driven to school and 69% of car journeys are under five miles, which is easily cyclable. Um, walking journeys tend to be under, under two miles and many are in transport poverty, so they don't have a car and they're forced into that, that situation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we talk about the NHS, which we love. Now, actually, 3% of patients are responsible for 45% of hospital costs. And those are the little three, uh, those grey gray blobs. Um, and um, it actually, in terms of the NHS spend, 70% is on long term conditions that we all saw in the first slide, some of which have a preventable element. So if it is critical to get those people on that first bit of the graph, get those people up off their sofa, going out for a walk every day is absolutely critical to whether we can afford to live the lifestyle we live. Next slide, please. So I wrote a paper in 2017 um, about if we have a focus on physical activity, we can reduce the need for social care. Aging is different from loss of fitness. We assume old people will sit. Actually, we can get if people get up and do it, do some exercise, they can drop a decade, go for a walk, climb the stairs, that kind of thing. Drop a decade in, in, in what they are capable of doing. Their, um, 
uh, capabilities. And that means they don't need so much social care. They just need someone to pop in and do some, make their bed, do some hoovering or get the shopping in or whatever. They don't need the 24 hour package of care to, to um, and to, to take them to the toilet, essentially. Um, and social care costs are pretty much the same as NHS costs now. We just don't see it because so much is paid for uh, privately. And we're each predicted to need 10 years of social care. We simply can't afford it. That's two, two and a half whole time equivalent people looking after one person who actually might not have needed that level of social care. Next slide, please. Um, pollution, the Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health um, put a very excellent report on air pollution. It's not just asthma, it's type 2 diabetes, it's dementia, that's poor cognition, it's heart attacks um, and it's cancer. And they recommended in their um, plan that the public can try alternatives to car travel. Next please. Uh, there's also particulate pollution. It's not just everyone changing to electric cars because the particulates from brake and wear and the tiny little particles um, kind of get absorbed straight into the bloodstream uh, from the lungs. And that has that's what has the huge effect on um, inf inflammation um, in terms of pollution effects on bodies. Next, please. So this is Eastbourne, which is lovely. Do come visit. Um, uh, this is the crash map. You can go to your own place, crashmap.co.uk. It'll tell you how many um, injuries there have been uh, in the last however many years you put in there. And a quarter across the UK, a quarter of child pedestrian injuries are in the most deprived wards. Children can't judge speeds. Most child injuries are before school and are after school. And Public Health England has said what's needed is safe and active travel for children before and after school um, and 20 mile an hour limits. Next slide please. Um, this is from the um, landmark report, the Marmot Review about health inequalities. This is the children, socioeconomic classification and children being killed, um, pedestrians and car occupants and cyclists. And it's huge and it's not fair, but I, I bring that to your attention that the policymakers who are generally from social class one and two um, don't see it, don't realise it, it's not necessarily part of their um, their understanding, uh, shall we say. We need to change what, what counts as normal. Next, please. Uh, I've just picked out some bits out of that 2010 review. It's an old review, but basically 20 mile an hour zones can reduce injury by 40%, half the number of casualties, that kind of thing. We need to do it and we need to do it as a, as a default. Next, please. The British Medical Association, um, I'm actually on the consultants committee of the British Medical Association representing the Medical Women's Federation, and I'm allowed to say this is their policy because it was voted upon in um, meetings. Um, it calls upon the Parliament to mandate the use of 20 mile an hour speed limits and um, yeah, across um, many roads, walk to school initiatives and that kind of thing. Next, please. So um, what can you do today? It's basically about rethinking who deserves time and space. And it's not just who deserves it right now. It's whether we want to pay in our taxes for people to um, be forced into sedentary um, behaviour and, and uh, getting ill um, and deconditioned and requiring more looking after. Um, so we basically cannot afford not to. Next slide, please. So it's my final slide. Exercise really is a miracle cure for all health. Best Buy. Um, less inactivity, pollution, loneliness, congestion, collisions, 22 minutes a day. Um, but change isn't just individuals, it's the culture, it's the family, it's what counts as normal. And for that, we need policies, institutions and all that kind of thing. A modal shift, e-bikes, an absolute game changer and we can't afford not to. Um, I'm on Twitter at Scarlett McNally um, and uh, you can go to my website or you can contact me if you, if you want the slides. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Um, clearly lots to say there. And uh, yes, I appreciate you cramming quite a lot in there. Um, for all the delegates, we will be sending out um, the recordings of this. So if you missed any of the detail of Scarlett's uh, presentation, you can catch up on that later. Um, and thank you for all our questions. One of the, the comments we've got is, can we have Scarlett McNally on peak time television? So uh, yes, we'll, we'll see if we can arrange that. Um, Thank you very much, Scarlett. We're now going to move on to our last two speakers. And first, we're going to hear from Richard, Richard Thorold. Richard is a trustee of the Louis Thorold Foundation, and he's going to give us his personal perspective on this issue um, and uh, uh, as a campaigner for 20 mile an hour national urban limit. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to speak on this webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm here, I think, representing 
the most important people in the whole of this webinar, and that's the victims. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm a trustee of the, the Louis Thold Foundation, and we are set up really to prevent deaths of young children on Britain's roads. Um, that's our rationale for being around, and you might ask why. Next slide, please. And this is the reason why. Um, the picture there you can see is of Louis Thorold, my beautiful little grandson, who was tragically killed in January of this year um, when he was out for a walk with his mother along a pavement uh, adjacent to the A10 near Cambridge. Um, his pushchair and his mother were hit by a driver driving a van who was pushed into their path by a, an elderly lady driver who didn't look before turning right and effectively ran into the van. The van was then pushed into the path of Louis and Rachel, and Rachel was severely injured and airlifted to hospital. Louis died on instantly on impact. I have to say the devastation to my family and but especially to Christopher and to Rachel has been immense. At 1500 on the 22nd of January, their life was perfect. At 1600, their baby was dead and Rachel was in the trauma unit, all because of speed and, and distraction as well. Um, not long after Christopher was given the news that, that Louis had died and Rachel was critically ill, he decided to set up a foundation in loving memory of Louis. And our rationale around setting up the foundation was to reduce to zero children's death, road deaths in the UK. Over 40 children a year die in the UK. Um, and we want to put a stop to that. Next slide, please. I'll skip these. These are our trustees. Christopher is my son, the father of Louis. Rachel is the mother of Louis. I'm obviously the grandfather and Claire is the aunt. Next slide, please. Why, what have we done uh, in terms of setting up the foundation? Well, the foundation is here to promote the advancement of road safety through supporting and campaigning for Vision Zero. Um, it's also so wants to support emergency response teams, including the Air Ambulance Service who were and first responder ambulances as well, who were unbelievably quick in responding to the, the crash that Rachel and Louis were involved in. We were also wanted to raise funds through various charitable activities so that we can invest in research surrounding road safety and associated rehabilitative treatments of severe brain injuries. And also, and that's what we're about today, campaigning for related road safety charities. Next slide, please. Our 2021 campaign has four strands, although some of them will run over into other years. The first strand is related to fixing the A10 where the, the crash happened. Um, and the second one is what we're about today, and that's making our streets harmonious through safe speeds and campaigning for a default speed limit of 20 miles an hour in all urban areas, and also areas where pedestrians and our little ones are vulnerable to road users, to, sorry, to road vehicles. The third one is, is centered around uh, the renewal process for driving licenses. We want to ensure that all drivers, when they come to renew, which is actually voluntary at the moment in the sense that you can automatically renew your license by just sending in a form uh, and declaring yourself fit and competent to drive. We want the government to look at that in more detail. And then the final one is the long-term goal of Vision Zero. Um, along with a lot of others, we want to see a, a society where there are zero traffic related fatalities and serious injuries. All those injuries are preventable. The Department for Transport, road engineers, planners and politicians actually need to start to take responsibility for the roads they create and the speed limits that they set. Uh, next slide, please. Well, since we started, and we only set the charity up um, in uh, mid-February of this year, we've managed to raise £40,000 to go towards preventing child deaths on Britain's roads. We've actually come to an agreement with Cambridge County Council for the roadmap, sorry, with Cambridge County Council to make the A10 safer for pedestrians by looking to reduce the speed limit. We have also made significant connections with like-minded charities and government agencies. 
and we've also had significant discussions both with the Attorney General and the Roads Minister Baroness Charlotte Via regarding the advocacy around child road safety and how we can actually make a difference to children and how they are perceived by the road user. Next slide, please. You'll see this slide and many, many people who have seen this in all different guises, but it's really related to survivability and speed. And, and you'll notice that we are using pedestrians, sorry, we're using children rather than adults. Um, there's no doubt that if the driver of the van who had hit, who hit Louis and, and uh, Rachel had been going a lot slower, although he was going at the legal limit for the road, if he'd been going at 30 miles an hour, the chances of survival for Louis and Rachel would have been significant. Uh, as we all know, at 20 miles an hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians will survive. At 30 miles an hour, five out of 10. At 40 miles an hour, you're lucky if one survives. The next slide, please. Uh, this is something that my son and I thought about a lot. Um, as adults, we don't notice what children notice. And we thought it would be a good idea just to remind people and point out to people, this is what a small child sees when a car comes towards them in a, in a typical day. It's, it's terrifying. It's like us having a lorry coming towards us. Little ones, children don't really stand a chance. And, you know, one of the things we've noticed that in the, the 118 days we've been looking at this sort of thing, 118 days is 118 days since the actual crash, that in our opinion, society, does it really care? I'm not sure, because if we did, Lee wouldn't be getting toxic um, questions from a car donated culture. And we would actually begin to look to make sure that we created safe places to walk, congregate and play in. Instead, it seems to us that the car still dominates our lives. But we have to ask the question, at what cost? Some of you would have seen this before, but the, the cost is, is immeasurable in some ways. The economic cost, we can measure. It's around 36 billion a year. But the cost, the human cost is immeasurable. Um, 1,800 lives lost every year, 480 pedestrians, over 40 children, children who will never go home, never grow up in, into adulthood, never again play in the sunshine, never share a happy Christmas with their parents and family, never have parties. This is just totally unacceptable. In addition to those 1,800 lives, there are another 26,000 or so who will have to cope with serious injuries, trauma and disability, maybe for the rest of their lives. And that type of disability, the types of injuries that they sustain will live with them forever, as will the bereaved families. Now, the bereaved families receive a life sentence. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> we'll say are told that they have lost a loved one. But, Interesting thing is this carnage is preventable with the right attitude, policies and politicians. And as we've said before, and this seminar is all about 20 miles an hour is a good start. 20 miles an hour in all urban areas as a default speed and in places where pedestrians are now little ones are vulnerable to road vehicles. It's very, very simple. Very simple. We all need to slow down to save lives, especially the lives of pedestrians and young children. Next slide, please. And just to finish on young children, I think we, we've come round to the view, Christopher and I, and, and the rest of the trustees, that, that there needs to be somebody who will protect our little ones from this carnage. And we would like to think that the Louis Thorold Foundation will be able to do that. We will honour their memory and protect future generations from road harm. And finally, I would say, please support a default 20 mile an hour and save lives you know it matters. And that's thank you very much. And remember, one final, final point. You need to spend precious time with your loved ones as you never know what fate awaits them. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for sharing that uh, that with us. I think in amongst all the science, engineering and sometimes politics, it's so important to remember that there are many families like yours grieving and suffering as a result of all these deaths and injuries on the roads. And that in so many cases, these, these deaths may well have been preventable. So thank you for that. Um, I'm sure Richard's uh, presentation has been very, very thought provoking. I can see there's a couple of comments in the chat. So please uh, post your comments and, and questions in the Q&A box. We're now going to move on to our last speaker of the session. And sorry, Rod, we have run a little bit over the time I was hoping, but I think we've had some really important messages. Uh, Rod probably doesn't need much introduction to many of you. He's been at the forefront of these discussions for many years as the founder and campaigner of 20s Plenty for us. Um, and Rod, I believe you're going to draw together some of the threads and, and give us a little bit more um, background to the, the campaign. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, that, that's uh, our campaign. Uh, next slide, please. I'd really like to thank the previous presenters. Uh, first of all, uh, Alvaro Gomez, uh, Spain, first in the world to set a national 30 kilometers per hour urban limit. Bravo, really well done. I'm so pleased to see that. Lee Waters from Wales. Yes, using devolved powers in the uh, a Welsh uh, Parliament to do the right thing. And this is very much based on Welsh values and setting a national 20 mile an hour limit. And in all my involvement uh, in, in Cardiff and in, in Wales, I've been impressed uh, at the way the Welsh institutions and uh, the uh, Senate members have actually got together and really grappled this in an objective way, right, to, to come up with their plans. Uh, Nan Tran from uh, WHO. Yes, real congratulations, setting the best practice and standards at global level for health and safety uh, on our roads. And that really is in, in, in encouraging because we do need that top level down uh, reference of, of what is the right thing to do. Uh, Scarlett McNally, thank you. Uh, yes, making the connection between how we move our bodies around and the activity the public health, which we all have as a uh, in our society, and the costs of, to society as well, if we don't have that uh, that um, uh, mobility uh, and that activity, uh, and how the uh, streets can make such a difference to that. Uh, and finally, uh, Richard Thorold, really reminding us that random events can get compromised by the speed of the people, and then can get turned from incident into tragic uh, casualties uh, uh, and, and death. And I'm reminded that speed may not be the cause of every crash, but it's implicated in every crash not being avoided. And that is where right, the effect of lowering uh, uh, speeds uh, comes in. So thank you for your actions. Today, thank you for your knowledge and thank you into, uh, for your insight into the issues which present us. Next slide, please. Uh, 20s Plenty for us, or Love 30 in places which use modern uh, uh, units of measurement, uh, founded in 2007. Small team of part time dedicated people based in the UK. We now have 500 local campaigns in the UK uh, and around the world, but most importantly, Beyond our small team, we have thousands of volunteer campaigners. That civic society, which uh, has been talked to, uh, about, they are people who actually within their society say, ours would be a better place if we had lower speeds. And so far, we now have 21 million people in the UK living in places where 20 mile an hour is the norm on most uh, residential and urban roads. And we assist and empower those campaigners that want lower urban and village speed limits to create better streets for people, as I said, in the UK and all over the world. And very much aligning with that global best practice, which uh, Anand was talking about from uh, WHO and the UN. Next slide, please. Yes, we've all seen this, and it, it really is quite telling isn't it there is what we we, we we see and there is the risk which there are uh so next slide please that is really is a a, a chasm unfortunately it implies that 
actually we should never go near roads and certainly it's one of the things which dissuades us from allowing our children to use those result, uh, roads to walk or cycle to school or to their friends so as a result many people who have cars keep them safe by driving them to school by not allowing them to cycle by not allowing them to uh, to walk out on those roads which are so dangerous and then we use another uh, a slide. Next, please. And here's a graphic which shows us how being hit by a car at different speeds in kilometers is an equivalent injury to falling out of a window. And yes, at 70 kilometers per hour, it's like falling from a sixth floor. Or 50 kilometers or, or 30 miles an hour, it's a third floor fall, whereas we can get the speed down to 30 kilometers per hour or 20 miles an hour, then it's equivalent to a first floor uh, fall. Next slide. But one question is, why would we knowingly want to jump or fall out of a window at these heights at all? And let's look, 17 meters and at 70 kilometers per hour, nine meters high at, 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 at 50 or nearly four meters at uh, 30 kilometers per hour. So what I've tried to do is combine some of these together. So let's have a look at the next slide. And here we have a different story. Because where we have 30 kilometer speeds, then the road is not a suicidal chasm. It's a drop that is less fearful, far more manageable, and it's survivable when mistakes are made. I think we can understand that. We've possibly all been in a place where we have physically been near a, a, a drop of around about 3.6 meters. We know that, yeah, it's to be cautious, but it's not like the chasm which we saw in the uh, left-hand uh, graphic. So let's move on. Next slide. Let's take that now and put it into the reality of what we have on our speed limit in our towns, cities, in villages. The desired norm, and that which the UN Global Road Safety Week is calling for, is a 30 kilometer per hour norm. Those streets, they're still not 100% safe. But let's compare that to the norm which we currently have, where we actually endorse 50 kilometers per hour or 30 miles per hour on our roads. That is the norm that we currently have. So next slide, please. Our 50 kilometers per hour and 30 mile per hour national urban limits are no longer fit for purpose. They actually create an environment on our roads which is exceedingly dangerous. It does not allow for mistakes to be made by any of the parties and then allow for avoiding action to take place to uh, uh, take away uh, uh, that uh, collision. And you know, it's not working. In the UK, we have 70,000 casualties per year on 30 mile an hour roads. And the public know. The public know this, right? 70% in surveys say 20 mile an hour is the right limit for residential roads. If we turn that around, that's actually 70% saying the government is wrong in setting a 30 mile an hour limit for those roads. And this has been rejected by so many cities in the UK and around the world. Already in the UK, all inner London boroughs have set 20 mile an hour on all roads. Health of the largest urban authorities in the UK have set 20 mile an hour on most roads. Wales is setting a national 20 mile an hour limit. In all, 20 mile, 1 million people, a third of the UK, live in 21, 20 mile an hour places which have rejected the national urban limit. Next slide, please. So we've talked about 20 mile an hour limits, 30 kilometers per hour, very much community-led uh, establishment uh, indoors. Now, in the UK, most authority 20 mile an hour, authority-wide 20 mile an hour limits do not have any physical calming. 
it's very much about engagement, more engagement, a little bit of enforcement, and maybe a little bit of en engineering. It's communication with what I call very much hearts and minds, rather than using speed bumps, which is communication via people's buttocks and spines. And you know, the point about speed bumps is when you don't have speed bumps, people speed up. Right. So it's it, it's not an enduring engagement which you you have. And what are the results from these reductions in in, in uh, um, the, the speed limits? Well, very slow roads. There's no reduction because the speed of the traffic was already low on perhaps those very small residential roads. Medium speed roads, you get a re reduction of, of 0 to 4 miles per hour, generally compliant, which is which is good. And on faster roads, you'll get a four to six uh, uh, mile per hour reduction, not necessarily compliant, but considerably uh, reduced. And when we consider that for each mile per hour reduction on average speed, there tends to be a, a reduction of 6% in casualties, then these have actually re resulted in casualty reductions, typically Bath 23%, Cowderley a day or 30%, Edinburgh, 33%. These are typical reductions after local authorities put in authority-wide 20 mile an hour limits. But they're not as good as they could be, you know, because by being localized, it suppresses that normalization of 20 mile an hour, which we're looking for. Next slide, please. By keeping a national 50 kilometer per hour limit or 30 miles an hour, we are abnormalizing the lower speeds which we want to normalize. We're actually normalizing unsafe higher speeds. And how can you create the 30 kilometers per hour norm when the process of setting it is to treat it as an exception? And that is the case in so many countries. The Stockholm Declaration says speed should be 30 kilometers per hour unless you can show evidence that a higher speed limit is safe. Yet in most countries, the legal process is that you have to have a 50 kilometers per hour national speed limit or more, unless you can show evidence that the 30 kilometers per hour limit is needed. And then you have all the red tape and obstacles and processes to go through in order to set that exceptional limit. So having a national urban limit of 50 kilometers per hour will never normalize driving at 30 kilometers per hour in urban or village areas. It increases the cost and complexity of implementation. It constantly replays the arguments in every town, city or community is should we replace the 50 kilometers per hour national limit with something which is more appropriate locally. It reduces the consistency. It builds this difference between progressive cities who are some of the early adopters and those what I've called status quo cities, the ones who want to leave everything as, as alone as long as they can. It justifies non-compliance as drivers say, well, in such and such a place, the speed limit for that sort of road is 50 kilometers per hour. So why do I have to slow down here? It reduces community ownership. One thing we know is the more drivers live in a 30 kilometers per hour or 20 mile an hour road, then the more the ownership is, they get the benefits and they can actually take those benefits to actually slow their driver down when they're in other people's uh, roads. And you know, isolated 30 kilometers per hour always endorses higher speeds elsewhere. So we keeping with this, if you like, this nine meter ditch, which is there for the roads, and we're keeping that high risk on our roads. Next slide, please. So I would say that it is illogical for governments to set a national urban limit of 50 kilometers per hour, and then urge all the local authorities and cities to change it to 30 kilometers per hour on most urban roads 
because it is considered inappropriate. Right. The inappropriate speed limit is the national one. That's the one which needs to be changed within our, our communities. And then, just like in, in, in Wales, local right, um, experience can be used to set the exceptions, which in line with the Stockholm de uh, uh, Declaration can be made where uh, it is safe to do so. Next slide. So how do we normalize 30 kilometers per hour for urban and village roads? We set a national limit. We recognize this Rose's prevention paradox model. Look it up, but it's where small health gains across the whole population can be more effective than higher gains for some individuals. It addresses random unclustered casualties that can never be addressed by site-specific interventions which follow uh, a, a cluster of uh, 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 crashes. Recognize the Stockholm Declaration, and that's 30 kilometers per hour as a default and evidence needed for higher. Right. It's uh, a foundation for the second decade of action on road safety. Debate those societal benefits from low speeds, link to the national values which you, you, you have, involve the civil society, it's not just motorized users, and create that multi-agency projects team with shared objectives, specialist skills, just like in Wales. The only logical conclusion is to set a national 30 kilometer per hour urban limit and allow exceptions only where the evidence shows it's safe. Next slide, please. Rod, can I ask you just to bring things to a conclusion because we do want to Very pick up good. on some questions. There it is, same message. We need to set that uh, as a norm. Next slide, please. You have a choice. Will you say so? Next slide. Next slide, please. And there we are. Okay, will you help set a national limit? Spain says yes. Yes, we have done it at 30 kilometers per hour. Wales says yes, we're doing it at 20 mile an hour. Maybe it's time for you to say, Yes, we will as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod. I know how passionate you are about this and uh, we appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everybody who's sent in questions. Um, we've got quite a lot in there. I don't think we're going to be able to cover everything. Um, so I'd like to invite all of our speakers to switch their cameras and microphones back on for the, the panel discussion. As I say, we're not uh, probably going to be able to cover everything, but we'll try and get through as many as we can. We've had a number of questions about enforcement, which I want to group together. Um, so uh, where should we start? Uh, perhaps Alvaro and, and Lee, as you're, uh, um, you're going ahead with this, there seems to be a suggestion from some of our audience that um, in areas where these limits have been introduced, um, it needs enforcement to actually get this, the speeds down to where we want them to be. Uh, could we start with you, Alvaro? How have you found that in Spain? Uh, thank you, Deborah. I, I, I pretty much agree with uh, what Nan said about enforcement. I think that uh, we should uh, focus on, on the relationship between uh, planning, street design, and speed limit. Uh, so, uh, and uh, enforce the speeds were appropriate, but uh, but not uh, but not in a in a massive manner, and not as the main message of the 30 speed of the 30 speed limit. Uh, uh, over the last years, I, I have found that many many people many people say um, a speed limit of 30 won't simply be not be not credible for for drivers unless you change the the the, the way the streets uh, look. But uh, so but 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 uh, the the question is the order in which you do things. You can either change the streets and then put a speed limit uh, or set a speed limit of 30, or you can do it the other way around. And we believe that uh, it's better to and it's easier for local authorities to to think about street design and planning if if they have the umbrella of a default uh, 30 speed limit. Thank you. Thank you. And Lee, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, well, I think it is clearly is uh, the Achilles heel of the whole approach because until now the general view uh, in the UK has been uh, that this will be self-enforcing 
uh, and there is some evidence to show that the average speeds have been reduced marginally. Uh, but for every uh, one mile an hour drop in the average speeds, I think there's uh, something uh, uh, I forget from the top of my head. Now, Rod may know, but there's a sort of six percent fall in in casualties. So there is a disproportionate impact every time you ratchet down the average level. So any speed reduction is, is good from a casualty reduction point of view. Um, clearly, we don't have the resources, the policing resources, to do hard enforcement of this comprehensively. Um, and uh, it's arguable whether that's desirable or not. Um, we are part, we, as I say, we are, we are piloting a number of different approaches in different parts of the country and important the things we're looking at with on the police. We're trying to be a bit more creative as well. So one of the things we're looking at is, because clearly on most urban streets, you're not able to overtake. So if it, the car in front of you is going slower, that's going to affect the speed of your car. So one of the things we're looking at is, can we mandate all public sector vehicles to be able to go no more than 20? So if you are a driver of a van owned by the council and you're doing more than 20, you'll be in breach of your employment terms of conditions to be doing that. So but in, by doing that, you're setting an effective pace car uh, type of dynamic onto local roads, and that will have some, some ripple effect of reducing overall speed. So I think we're trying to look at things like that alongside community engagement, uh, a general behavior change to buy people in, in, into the values of what we're trying to do. I think values are really important from our experience of trying to do uh, behavioral change, both from recycling to organ donation. It's getting to people to buy into the, to what we're trying to achieve rather than simply trying to enforce it. But the you know, ha having said all of that, hard enforcement does have a role and we're looking at how speed cameras can be part of this so we're not looking at hard engineering as a general approach thank you very much and rod there's quite a number of specific comments about the faversham scheme um i've only been there once i'm afraid since it was uh, put in but i thought compliance was reasonably good but clearly people who live there don't um do you have any comments on on that from a faversham point of view i, I think well what we know it, it it depends on really where, what your reference point is we know from experience that, and, and we know from research um on, on using floating car data that in residential streets about 75 percent of vehicles are within the enforcement threshold and we know that in city centers it's about 80 percent of vehicles are, are, are within that uh I, I think what's important in terms of uh enforcement is to do some enforcement rather than say there will be no enforcement and i think that makes a big difference in in uh if we're endorsing the validity of a, a, a 20 mile an hour limit i think isa uh, intelligent speed assistance will will come in in taking compliers and enabling them to to actually feel good about going to that that speed limit and not wanting to go faster and also there there is an observation sometimes uh, within communities, we will get lower speeds, but because it's not perceived as 100% compliance, that can sometimes be perceived as a failure. But if you have actually reduced speeds from, say, 28 miles an hour, 26 miles an hour, down to 22, 24 miles an hour, you've made a big reduction in, in risk. So it all depends upon how you, how you uh, uh, measure that. But in most places where they have 20 mile an hour, the residents come out and say, yes, don't take it away, whatever you do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got a specific question here. We have a 20 mile an hour default in our borough, Richmond upon Thames, but a continuing, ar continuing argument which has persisted is the air quality consequences of slower speed. Um, I'm assuming from that it's the, um, the pollution that's caused by, by uh, cars um, idling I'm, I'm not quite sure even from those who've never had any interest in air pollution where is the best science to rebuff these challenges um scala i don't know if you have any knowledge of that sort of thing um would you know where to find the science on air pollution um no i'm afraid i don't um the only point i'd make is it's about the changing behavior um that if you can get it's the people from being in a car to being on their bike and or, or walking or scooting or something um, it, you, if you can get that behavior change you're changing the, the total amount of pollution mm -hmm. um, I've looked I've looked at the numbers of um, 
uh, from cycling in pollution. Um, it, it doesn't damage health until a certain level and mostly in UK cities we're below that certain level but no I don't have the answer sorry thanks no no I'm sure you're right I think modal shift is, is probably a bigger bigger issue in this has anyone else got any oh Rod looks as if he's got his hand up Rod hi it's interesting because I usually find from experience that it's the people who have the biggest cars who are most concerned about pollution uh, but but moving on what we do know it's about physics and you know the the, the amount of energy which is required to get to 30 uh, miles per hour uh, is over twice as much as that to get to 20 miles an hour and if you're keeping on repeating that acceleration braking and accelerating again you're using a lot more more more, more fuel so uh, some studies have been done particularly in Pura College uh, uh, London and they found an 8% reduction in uh, NOx and PM10 pollutants uh, when you move from a 30 mile an hour cycle to a 20 mile an hour uh, cycle. And let's remember as well that when you're doing steady state right, uh, uh, driving, that on, on most modern cars, you'll get around about 80 to 100 miles per gallon right, at a steady 20 miles an hour. It's not going slow, which actually causes the, the, uh, you to use fuel and uh, emit. It's the constant acceleration and deceleration. Thank you. Uh, Lee, did I see your hand? Yeah, just because I think I think we need to confront this head on um, because this is an argument made constantly by local people who don't want 20 miles an hour, whether this will be have an adverse impact on air quality. In terms of the direct question, what is the science? Uh, if you uh, if you Google the task and finish report that we published, so you type in Welsh Government uh, 20 mile an hour task and finish report, there is actually uh, some footnotes to some scientific studies there which show that overall it does bring a benefit to improved air quality but there are conflicting studies on this and i think what we say is the evidence is mixed but the overall public health impact is definitely positive but it depends on the situation because if you've got lots of speed pumps where people are stopping and starting and accelerating it can have an adverse impact on air quality and i think we should be honest uh, about that but the overall direction of travel uh, is uh, is a positive one Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question here which is directed to you, Nan. Is there any evidence of 20 miles per hour causing an increase in collisions? I think that's quite an interesting one. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I have not seen any evidence uh, of that. And like I said, you know, we are, uh, you know, I just want to talk about evidence. I mean, one of the reasons why we find this very exciting is because we think that this is an opportunity to actually collect real evidence from countries that have actually implemented a national, a nationwide a default speed limit of, of, of 30 kilometers or 20 miles per hour. And I think this is going to provide extremely useful lessons for other countries. So we would love to, 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 to be engaged in this conversation with Spain, with Wales, so that we can continue to collect um, the experiences and so that we can share them with other countries as well. Thank you. Um, as I said, we have had a huge number of, of comments and questions, so we're not going to be able to get through all of them today. And I do want to finish as close to four o'clock as we can. Um, but it, it's just a question for you, really, Richard, a final question. We've had quite a lot of people uh, in the comments and questions saying that uh, they have anti 20 mile an hour people that they're meeting on their doorstep. Have you found any argument reasoning which quickly changed this, their minds to become a supporter? Um, I'm, I'm guessing that you have probably the best ever reason but if you were to give a message to people what would that be Richard in terms of how you can persuade people of the the benefits of 20 miles an hour 30 kph zones well I I, <laughs> I could be blunt and say go down, down the trauma center to be honest um, there's no doubt that uh, just to put it in a little bit of perspective I mean I received a phone call from my son about 5 30 on the 22nd of January saying he was sat in the chapel of rest. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the, the point I would make to everybody is I only ever met my grandson once. I met him in the chapel of rest. Why? Because somebody was going pretty fast on a road, albeit they were in the legitimate speed limit, you know, but at the end of the day, my grandson didn't survive. And my uh, daughter in law was airlifted to hospital in a life-threatening situation so i think i would say to everybody you know and it's back to enforcement as well when everybody was talking about enforcement i mean my my everybody goes 
to the speed limit. If it's 30, most people stick to 30. If you set it at 20, the vast majority of people will do 20. There will always be some that won't, but there will always be some that don't do 60, 70 or 80 on the motorways, you know. Uh, and I think that if we're trying to convince people, uh, there's no doubt it's, it's devastated our family. And, and talking to other people, and Krista has received, you know, tens of thousands of emails from people all over the world saying, I know exactly how you feel. It happened to me. My, my son or my daughter was killed, knocked over on a bike or whatever. There's no doubt that I think that if, if as I said the other day to everybody, if uh, this sort of tragedy was to happen to a minister of the crown, I suspect we would be debating in parliament how we get to 20 as soon as possible. And for me, it is really saying to everybody, think about speed. Speed is a killer. You know, the faster you go, as Rod has said, the more likely you are to hit somebody and to kill somebody. So I think for me, it would be saying to them, just think about your little ones. You know, my son doesn't have a son anymore. I don't have a grandson. There are 40 families exactly like that today. 200,000 in the world like that today. 50 million people grieving about an accident, well, not an accident, a crash of some sort around the world. You know, and as somebody has said before, um, just to finish on everything, really, you know, if four jumbo jets went, ran into the, you know, the ground today, there would be hell to play. But yeah. that's what happens in the United Kingdom every year. 1,800 people are killed. Yeah. Thank you. There's my story, that. really. <laughs> Uh, we, we really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Thank you. Uh, did I see your hand, Lee? Did you? Uh... Yeah, I was just going to very briefly, as a Minister of the Crown, who's been having these conversations in the last two weeks with people, you know, uh, you know they're a small minority uh, aren't happy with this, and I don't think you're going to change their mind. Uh, the argument I've used, and it's, uh, it's based in values, uh, which says a child hit at 20 is six times more likely than a child hit at 30. That may involve inconveniencing you, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm trying to change, save children's lives, and I make no apology for that. Thank you. And we I fully agree you. with you, Lee. Sorry, I fully agree best. with Lee. Absolutely right. Thank you all very much. I'm, I'm really sorry, but we have run out of time, and I do need to draw this webinar to a close. I can see that Nan's already had to leave us, which is a shame. On behalf of all of our audience today, I haven't got the final numbers, but uh, certainly it was very, very well attended. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for your time in preparing and delivering your talks today. Um, we've learned a great deal and the number of questions and comments really have shown how uh, thought provoking this is, what a, a hot topic it is and how inspirational your presentations have all been. So thank you to Alvaro, Lee, Nan, Scarlett, Richard and Rod. Oh, Nan's back with us. Thank you, Nan. Uh, much appreciated. Can I also thank Landor for the organisation of today's conference, the 20 is Plenty for Us organisation for highlighting this topic and everyone who's worked so hard behind the scenes to, uh, to make it all happen and facilitate these proceedings. A recording of the conference will be sent to you via email and posted on YouTube. So if you've missed any of the detail and they were very content packed, particularly Scarlett, so I'm going to have a look at yours again. Um, you will be receiving that in the next few days by, by email. Thank you all for your time and contributions to the debate today. If you haven't done so already, please have a look at the UN Road Safety Week website and the Streets for Life toolkit to find out more about this vital issue and to get involved, which is, is the most important bit. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all to everyone. Goodbye.